Hey everybody, welcome back. So I'm going to talk tonight about the idea of being emotionally hijacked while we're in benzo withdrawal or bind. And this is probably something that even before um, you were injured, um, I know for sure for me, it, 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 it certainly happened on occasion, probably more when I was younger, but I'm sure there's been occasions as an adult, I've been emotionally hijacked. And in essence, what that is, is where, you know, fear, anger, jealousy, hurt, some sort of emotion takes over. And basically we, you know, speak or act in a manner that really isn't kind of out of character. It's kind of an extreme. And we, you know, we basically have hijacked the rest of our brain that would maybe regulate emotion, calm us down, help us tolerate frustration, be reasonable, be wise, be rational. We've kind of hijacked that part. Now, hopefully, you know, for most of us, when that happens, especially as we get older, uh, at some point, the higher part of our brain kicks in, the prefrontal cortex kicks in, and we get reflective about our behavior, and we're able to, you know, think about what we've just done or said and take ownership of it, right? But again, this is a an example of being emotionally hijacked. Um, and once we are in benzo withdrawal or bind, it's my theory, anyway, that many of us kind of live in a state of being emotionally hijacked. Maybe not 24-7, but with some regularity and some more than others. So as you know from my last videos, many of them, I talk a lot about the limbic system. So I'm not going to go a ton into it again. I'm not going to go into all the different structures of it because I do that on a lot of different videos. Um, I think I just did one, I don't know, a week or two ago on it as well. But you know, this limbic system is the part of our brain that I feel is probably the most affected um, by the injury because it's where the majority of our GABA A receptors are. And remember, this is the part of our brain that is the emotional uh, processing center. Um, it is our security alarms. It is basically the fire alarm of our home. And it is also the command center for the rest of the body. So all systems can get mucked up, right, when the limbic system is affected. And when our limbic systems, in my opinion, are greatly affected. So again, as I've referred to it before, this in bind, we have this limbic system that's on fire and this, this alarm system that is constantly sounding danger, 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 right? And remember, I said in another video, the amygdala, which is that fire alarm, the smoke detector in our house, it's very dumb, but it's very loyal. It would rather get things wrong a thousand times and get it right one time. Well, in our system, um, because it's hijacked and because it's overactive and it's on fire, that alarm is going off and it's reading everything potentially as danger. And what happens to the rest of our brain, especially the higher level parts of our brain that, again, tend to be responsible for reason and rationality and wisdom and problem solving and um, tolerating frustration and emotionally regulating ourselves, what it does is it actually stands down because it's kind of smart, okay? It, the rest of the brain is kind of smart. And it says, you know, the most important thing is that Jennifer is safe and secure and out of danger. And so I need to stand down to let the limbic system, to do, let the amygdala do its thing to make sure she's out of danger, okay? So because we have this injury, because we have this kind of chemically driven fire going on in that part of our brain, the other parts of our brain are kind of on standby, okay? Because they're not getting the message that we're out of danger, okay? So we're not accessing a lot of being reasonable, wise-minded, being able to talk to ourselves and talk us out of our fear and out of our panic and out of our distress. Um, it's hard to tap into that wise mind because again, it's standing down allowing for our brain to heal us, okay? So I, I wanted to talk about this because, again, I think that when we understand the mechanisms of why we're feeling what we're feeling, um, it can help us not be so afraid of it or to think that we're crazy or to think that um, we're going to be, you know, we're doomed this way for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> it's not the case. Um, so in the meantime, um, we've got this wiser, rational mind that is standing down, We've got this cortisol and adrenaline, this nonstop sounding fire alarm going off. Um, and we don't have access to those other parts that are going to help us. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that 
that I find interesting when I'm talking to people, and I have felt this myself through this whole thing, is so many people will talk about feeling like they're a little scared child in this. Um, and there's, I think, a reason for that. You know, <clears throat> most of us, um, not all of us, but most of us are not living in a time um, where we're in constant and present danger. Like maybe we would have been in another time or maybe we were living without, you know, a home around us or a tribe around us, um, people around us. Maybe we had to kind of kill and hunt for our food. We had to keep our family safe from predators. And again, I'm not saying that this isn't true for some of us out in the world. We know that's not the case. But hopefully for the majority of us, we're not living in a constant present danger uh, on a day-to-day basis. And so our amygdala um, hasn't had to practice a ton okay? Like it used to have to be listening for the rustle in the brush to decide if it was a rabbit or a lion, right? Or if it was another clan coming along or whatever was going on, okay? So what happens for us is our amygdala um, in feeling all this fear in our limbic system and feeling all of this distress and danger, 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 it, it begins to make these crude associations. What I mean by crude is primitive, okay? And I want you to think about how many of our memories are really formed in childhood, and they're not even in our awareness. So many of them are pre-verbal, not even in our awareness, because we are dealing with an unformed, immature amygdala and hippocampus, those two parts of our limbic system. Um, certainly when we're kids, none of our brains are fully formed, right? That's why we're not this most rational people in the world when we're six, right? Um, because that part of our brain is just not formed yet. But either is the other part of our brain. And so what it tends to do is, as a, especially as children, and especially when we don't have a lot of access to language and being able to check things out and understand things, uh, things get coded uh, a lot of times as trauma. So anything, and I'm not talking about overt traumas necessarily, I'm talking about anything that might be overwhelming or overstimulating, or scary, or confusing to that little mind. It could be, you know, <clears throat> you know, hearing a loud noise. It could be, you know, a Fourth of July thing, and you're 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 very sensitive to sounds, and you're hearing all the pops of the fireworks, and it's you know it's igniting a very sensitive little system that doesn't understand you're safe, doesn't understand there are fireworks, and they're not going to hurt you. Um, and so it makes these crude associations, and I want to give kind of a couple of examples of this. Um, when I was little, I, you know, had all kinds of little fears. I was, had a definite fear of flushing the toilet. I, I had this idea that something was going to come up out of that hole and grab me, um, if I flushed the toilet. And one thing that I think is really important for us to know is that, you know, while that was not an odd fear when I was four, at 49, it would be considered a very irrational, bizarre fear, right? I mean, but those are the kind of things I'm dealing with in bind. I'm dealing with very irrational fear. Suddenly we are afraid to be alone. We are afraid to leave our homes. We are afraid of the mailbox. We are afraid of somebody knocking at the door. We are afraid of strangers. Um, We are afraid of telephones. Um, We are afraid of the dark. We're afraid of being overstimulated on and on and on. Again, a lot of these things would have been very, um, it would have made sense as little people. But as big people, they don't make a lot of sense. But if we think about it from this angle that we're really dealing with the limbic system on fire, that's making very primitive associations to other times in our lives where we maybe were overwhelmed, overstimulated, confused, um, out of control feeling, um, not grasping whether we were in danger or whether it was just discomfort, okay? So another thing when I was little, two things I can think of. One was that when I was, when I was six, we went to Disney World. And I still have this memory clear as day that I was lost in Disney World. Now, I was not lost in Disney World. In fact, my parents never lost sight of me, but I had lost sight of them. So even though in theory I was not lost, my memory is that I was lost. My emotional memory is that I was lost and scared and looking up at a lot of giants that I didn't know. Um, and I felt that I had lost my family. And it was only a few minutes. It felt like a lot longer as a little kid. But again, they had never lost sight of me. So from their angle, I was safe. From my angle, I was not safe. And I still have that memory. Even though I know the truth, 
even though I know the rest of the story, how it got coded in that as that little person, I was six, was fear and being lost and and maybe never seeing my family again. Who knows? Um, I didn't know that Disneyland was a pretty pretty. Disney World was a pretty safe place and probably Mickey or Minnie would have found my parents and I would have been fine. I didn't know any of that at six. I was just freaking out. The other thing that happened when I was little was when I was born until about a year and a half, I was I was born without a hip socket. <clears throat> and so I had to go into hip splints and leg braces and funny shoes with bars. My first year and a half of life, I was, you know, in like hard plastic diapers that snapped and held my legs at funny angles and and, you know, and I was zero to one and a half years old. I had no language. I have no memory of this, no conscious memory of this. But I have to believe that I was probably feeling very out of control, really unclear as to what was going on. I didn't have a lot of agency. I couldn't move freely like another baby would be pulling themselves up in their crib or starting to crawl, move their legs, kick their legs, do all the things that you would do. I, I was often mechanically restrained. And again, even though I don't have any memory of that, um, I know that as I got older, I did not like the feeling of ever being restrained, of ever being trapped, um, of, of ever being held down, um, anything. And again, I didn't know why. Okay, And I obviously came to understand that as I got older. I also had a health situation when I was about three. So I had some language at that point, but not much, where again, I had to be restrained and it was very painful. And I have these they're not memories. I don't remember them as they happened. I just have the encoded memory that was held and stored in my immature hippocampus and amygdala, in my, in my limbic system, as trauma. And what is trauma? Trauma is any interruption in the fabric of your experience, okay? Sometimes those are big T traumas of you know, physical, you know, emotional, sexual, um, neglect, things like that. And then a lot of times there's lots of little traumas where, again, just as little kids, you feel overwhelmed, you feel confused. And so I say all this to say that now here I am, that was my first year and a half year of life. And then again, when I was three, fast forward 49 years or 48 years at that point, And I'm back in a situation that makes no sense to me. I don't know what's happening. I feel trapped. I feel out of control. I don't know who to trust. I don't know where to go. I don't know what's, I don't know how to make sense of my experience. I'm scared. I'm vulnerable. And what happens to my brain? It makes this primitive association back to this time in my life where I felt all those things before. And so I think that's one reason in, in part why we feel so young in this, because I think it's true for many of us. Maybe we don't have leg braces and, 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 and mouth diseases like I did, but maybe there was something else going on. Maybe you, you know, as a young person, lived in a home that was very chaotic or dysfunctional, a lot of yelling, a lot of, you know, maybe there were a lot of siblings and they were very loud. Maybe you, um, you know, felt too alone you know, whatever it was, again, they don't have to be big T traumas, but they can be times that were coded in that very primitive part of our brain as scary. And now as we feel scared again, we go back to that. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, the other thing I want to say about being kind of emotionally hijacked, again, by this limbic system that's that's misfiring and on fire and our more rational brains not working so well is we have, um, you know, our, our feelings don't get capped in this. So maybe you guys can relate to this, but I know that I feel things very, um, in a very exaggerated way and not even in a way that doesn't even really make sense. So for example, my, I had, many of you know, I lost my dog a couple weeks ago. Well, my grief over that has not felt like sadness or nostalgia, or missing Addie. It has felt like some sort of building, scary, terrified, chaotic, overwhelming feeling that is going to take me over. I feel like I'm going to actually implode or explode. And, it, and I think part of it is because I don't have the rest, I don't have that part of my brain intact. It's, it's, it, is, it is standing down. 
and it, and, it, and it stands down in this process for a lot of for a lot of the time. And so all of my ability to problem solve or rationalize or say, oh, I had almost 12 good years with her. She lived her life expectancy. Yes, it's sad, but she died in a way that was so lovely. You know, like I don't have that ability to be able to calm myself down with those higher level ways of thinking and ways of relating and even higher levels of defense. You know, through my life, I've been able to develop things like humor, you know, towards life and myself and intellect. I've been able to rationalize, sublimate. I don't know if you know what sublimate is, but sublimate is basically when you take something and turning it, turn it into something more adaptive. So like somebody really aggressive maybe becomes a really good football player and they sublimate their aggression onto the football field and excel, okay? So sublimation, intellectualization, rationalization, wise mind, all of that stuff, um, I don't have access to on a regular basis or as readily as I would before this injury occurred. And so there's no cap to my emotions. My grief feels overwhelming and it doesn't even feel like grief. It can feel like terror. Um, I can feel sad and it can feel like overwhelming despair. I can feel um, um, I can feel frustrated and I feel out of control and totally dysregulated. Um, I can even have strange things like I know something is meaningful to me, but I'm not registering it in the same way. Because again, that, that amygdala and that limbic system is the seat of our emotional processing, the seat of our emotional memory, and it's hijacked. So this is how sometimes we can describe that we're looking at our kids or our partners or our parents or what, and we don't feel anything. We don't feel anything. And then there's times I can look at my, you know, my dog's paw and feel like I'm going to explode with, I don't know what the feeling is, grief, uh, tenderness. I have no idea. All I know is it's getting not registered properly. Okay. Because again, the limbic system's on fire and I'm, I'm, I am emotionally hijacked. So one of the things that somebody asked me on one of my last videos about the limbic system was, okay, well, what do we do about this? If we have this limbic system injury and we understand it and we're being emotionally hijacked, what can we do? Well, <laughs> I think that's a hard question to answer, but I have some ideas. You know, one is the, you know, the, the, is time. And I know we hate that answer because, you know, until we've been in bind, time for healing for most of us was like, you know, a bad cold a week, um, you know, broken legs six weeks. And now we're dealing with, Un uncapped time frames, but time for sure. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is, is the language of the limbic system. So again, if we're dealing with emotional hijacking, because our limbic system is out of control, the language of the amygdala and the limbic system is not words. Okay. Words are the language of the higher level parts of our brain, wise mind, rational mind, problem solving mind. Okay. Our hijacked mind does not respond to Jen. That is not an intruder. That is your stuffed animal sitting in the corner in the dark, okay? No, because what's happening is I see the thing in the dark, my mind tells me it's an intruder, and then I can't calm myself down because I can't cap it out, okay? So when I say we have to kind of speak the language of the limbic system, what I mean is we have to show it. So for example, we go back to my example of being afraid of flushing the toilet when I was a kid. My parents could tell me 50 times, nothing's going to come out of that toilet and grab you, right? Um, but it really took me flushing the toilet over and over and over, sometimes with mom and dad standing right there, most of the time with them standing there, and realizing there wasn't going to be something that came out of the hole and grabbed me. And eventually... My limbic system calmed down and it learned there was no monster in the toilet, okay? But again, had mom and dad just been like, go to your room, there's nothing in the toilet, this is ridiculous, you're being childish. No, it would not have calmed me down because that's not the language of the limbic system. We have to show it. Now, so I guess what I'm saying is like, let's say now you're afraid of, you know, leaving your home, okay? Um, if you if you listen to my a couple of my other videos like benzo-induced OCD, that type of thing, I'm not 
promoting contrived exposures, you know, where you put yourself in situations and flood yourself to show to yourself that you're safe. Because I feel like we live kind of in a constant state of exposure, at least I do. I'm kind of afraid all the time. So the way I try to handle it is on, on, my, on days that I feel like I can, I try to take baby steps. And I think if you're listening to any Benzo coach out there, Baylissa, Jennifer Lee, David Powers, Michael Preeb, uh, Chris Page, um, I know I'm blanking on others and I'm sorry for that, but um, most of the time you're going to you're, you're going to hear about baby steps. You're not going to hear, yeah, go out there and flood the hell out of your system. Why? Because we already have this incredibly sensitized nervous system, okay? And this nervous system doesn't have uh, right now access to all of the other parts of ourselves that we used to have. Okay, they're still there. We haven't lost anything. When things calm down, we're going to get all that back. All those defense mechanisms we had that were higher level and adaptive, all of those great qualities that we developed over time, we're going to get it all back. We've just temporarily lost access to it most of the time. So you want to take baby steps because baby steps are going to show that part of your brain, oh, I'm highly uncomfortable and I'm in distress, but I'm not in danger. I'm terrified to leave my front door. But when I do, I'm not actually going to die. I'm not actually going to pass out. There isn't actually going to be somebody there that's going to hurt me. And we begin to slowly show ourselves. But again, I am not advocating for flooding your system. So if you're a family member listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, just get in the car and drive cross country and don't worry about it or get on the airplane. No, we're, not, we're dealing with a chemical injury here. And we're dealing with a limbic system that is, that is on fire. And so we have got to speak its language, but we've got to do so in a gentle way with a lot of grace for ourselves and for what we're up against. And another example of this is, it's not to say that we can't use positive self-talk. We can, because we don't have complete non-access to the higher parts of ourselves. If you're going through withdrawal, you probably notice there's maybe certain times a day or certain weeks or certain months where you have moments or glimpses of the higher parts of yourself, the less afraid parts of yourself. And so for example, let's say you go through, let's say you're dealing with intrusive thoughts in this, unwanted intrusive thoughts, which is another symptom of a, of a limbic system on fire. And I have this, well, Sally Winston, who writes a lot about intrusive thoughts, talks about these three parts of our brain. You have worried mind. So worried mind would be, oh my God, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt my child. Oh my God, I can't believe I just thought that. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to hurt my child. And then you have false comfort. False comfort comes in and says, Jennifer, you're not going to hurt a child. You love children. And then my worried voice is like, then why would I think that? And false comfort would say, it doesn't matter. It's okay. You you, you know you love children. You're never going to hurt a child. And my worried voice would say, I don't know. Maybe something's changed. Maybe I've developed something overnight. Maybe I really don't love children. It's all been an act. And then maybe false comfort would say, well, how about you call a couple people then and see what they think. They know you. They know you don't want to hurt children. They'll reassure you, right? And then we get stuck on that reassurance loop. And this happens with all kinds of things when we're in benzo withdrawal. We're constantly seeking reassurance and it doesn't usually work. Normalization works where we find twinship and similar experiences with other people. But that reassurance of tell me I'm not going to hurt somebody. Tell me I'm not going to die. Tell me I'm not going to... What, what if I don't heal? Whatever it is, right? So we have worried voice, false comfort voice. That is a trap. That is where we get stuck most of the time. And then she talks about wise mind, okay? And what wise mind would say is, you know what, guys? You know what worried voice and false comfort? You're on a junk channel. We're not even going to think about this because the antidote, right, to extreme anxiety, which is in essence uh, a different way to think about part of what's going on with this, with this limbic system on fire, is showing it it is irrelevant. That's the baby steps. It's not, there is no real danger in going to the mailbox. There is no real danger in being alone for 10 minutes. There is no real danger in walking out your front door, okay? There may be discomfort for sure because you have this misfiring limbic system. So wise mind is basically telling um, the limbic system um, guys, you're on a junk channel. And that's the other thing about this that, that I want you to really understand when it comes to being emotionally hijacked. When it comes to being emotionally hijacked, we are on a junk channel, okay? We don't have access 
to the rest of us that can give context to that, you know, that scary movie uh, that's playing in our minds. Okay, we don't have the rest of the story. We, if we've been robbed of the rest of the context, and this is where I go back to that the idea of the our nervous systems in this and our brains in this being a tin can, right? You drop a dime into a tin can, it makes a rattle. You drop a dime onto a on a padded bed and it makes no really no sound at all the dime hasn't changed the stressor hasn't changed the the fee, the mailbox hasn't changed the stranger hasn't changed the doorknob hasn't changed the uh, whatever nothing's changed except for the repository our repository our receptacle our nervous system our limbic system has changed it is raw and everything's rattling around and so if we are going to have you know when we do have access to our wise minds and our rational minds What's the most important thing is to kind of show it. You're just you're uncomfortable, you're scared, you're in distress, but you're not in danger. And at the end of the day, this is a junk channel. Okay, this is showing you a junk channel. That's all it is. And when we have a sensitized mind and a tired mind, and we are creative, imaginative people, which most of us are, um, we're going to run into problems with this, and things are going to get hijacked. Okay, and then if we happen to have been fixers and doers and problem solvers and tacklers in our lives, then this is where it goes really crazy for us because we don't like to feel out of control. We don't like to feel hijacked. We don't, we want to solve the problem. We want it fixed yesterday. We want to, you know, do whatever we need to do to get out of the situation we're in. And we've been really good at that in our lives for the most part. So if you're somebody that's also a human doer, um, being emotionally hijacked is horrific, okay, because you're, you basically feel at the mercy, and you are in many ways, um, and we fight it. And so we end up making things, we add a lot of oh no's and oh my gods, and this is terrible, and this is scary, and I hate how I feel, and I'm a monster, and I'm never going to be like myself again, and I've lost myself forever. And because we're so used to being able to solve our problems and other people's problems and fix things and make stuff happen, and now we just have to wait this out and do what we can to offer ourselves some grace and recognize we are emotionally hijacked in this for good reason. We've just gone over the mechanisms of it. Um, it makes sense why we feel the way we feel and think the way we think. It makes sense why we act the way we act. And you know, there are a couple things we can do to not make it worse, maybe make it a little better. But I think grace and understanding um, are probably the two most important things. So anyway, I hope this was helpful, guys, and um, it's getting long-winded, so I'm going to stop for now.